Hello and welcome to Upfront Toronto, conversations with people that move the city forward. In our conversation today, we're turning the tables a bit and we're going to uh, interview Alon, but I first wanted to start with a introduction of- Hello, Alon Liza, is. by the way. Hello. Hi. Hello, Alon, thank you for joining us. Thank you um, for having me. My pleasure, our pleasure. Uh, so Alon is the co-founder of Peter, what was Peter Brake and is now Ozeri Bakery with his father, ex-wife and brother Guy. And what started as a small store in 1996. Um, yes, at Young 1996, February. Yep. Um, at Young and Wellesley eventually grew into a wholesale business selling pita and crackers to small stores within Toronto. Uh, eventually you opened up a commercial bakery known for making pita, morning rounds, uh, one buns, lavash crackers, and now the new keto super seed crunch, which is not only delicious, but slightly addictive. Um, as it, as if that didn't keep you guys busy enough, you three years ago decided to open up Parallel Brothers with your brothers Guy and Aaron, uh, and that's on Geary Avenue. There's, and you specialize in sesame butter, um, and within that, uh, that space, you have a restaurant component along with designated space, obviously, for manufacturing the sesame butter, uh, which is also known as tahini. And, and then you also uh, make halva, various sesame butter inspired foods. And if I'm not mistaken, the restaurant itself has sesame butter in within all of the dishes. So I think I think I got it all. There's a little bit more, but but if you want to just jump in and, and hi, thank you, Lisa. So yes, that covers pretty much the uh, history, the business history, and uh, just as a snapshot of uh, who who's who, who we are or who I am. And uh, thank you. I, I'll I'll introduce Liza. Liza and I, um, first of all, we're cousins, and um, even though we're she, not cousins, she... <laughs> we're not cousins. <laughs> we're we're cousins, and uh, not only cousins, <laughs> but. We worked together for uh, many years at the bakery and we've traveled around North America to shows and have uh, um, chased customers or consumers and buyers and uh, worked uh, extensively on uh, the, the bakery's branding and marketing. So we have a, a long history together and we kind of uh, got together at this time to uh, create a podcast that uh, is close to both our hearts. And uh, I guess this is our way to introduce ourselves to you, Liza. Yeah, um, yeah, I think you pretty much got it all. We do have a long history and um, yeah, and it, it's been a lot of fun and we thought we'd branch off and do something a little different. Um, and that's where this podcast came up. So, and, and really this was your idea, Alon, you approached me with it and I immediately said no um, and then realized that I would give it a little bit of thought <laughs> and then you, yeah, you wrote that's me kind of uh, my, my relationship with most people. <laughs> Just tell them what's going to happen. It's um, funny what, how people change their answer after 10 questions, uh, similar identical questions. Identical so. questions, text messages, phone calls, voicemails, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. a, a random visit. If, yes. Even if you live far Something away. Like that. Uh, but I, I guess, well, is there anything you want to add to your intro? Is there anything I missed? I think we're pretty close. So okay. you'll be interviewing me today uh, yeah. based on the same format as Upfront Toronto. And uh, we're doing this interview just after the fact. We have about six rec recordings already with amazing, amazing entrepreneurs. Like, I can't believe that they've talked to us, how interesting they are. And, um, you know, I, I learned so much from talking to people. So, but then we decided to do this one, which will be the first uh, podcast just to introduce ourselves because it's yeah. who the fuck are these guys uh, interviewing people and, and why should I listen to them? I mean, I really don't know why you should listen to us, but, you know, hopefully the guests will be more interesting than our, our, our interviewing abilities. And, <laughs> and, I and already, hopefully we'll uh, get better. Hopefully I apologize we'll better. for the first few, which, you know, we are semi-new to this. Uh, but we're definitely dedicated and getting better every interview. Uh, the guests were stellar from the first one. So I'm yeah, just brilliant. Yeah, we've had we've had some great guests and it's been a lot of fun. It's been fun and interesting. And 
in some cases, fascinating to hear people's stories and how they got there and why they continue doing what they're doing. So I guess I just want to start with asking you, Alon, is where did you come up with the idea for the podcast? Before we get into the format that we're going to, that we use for Upfront Toronto, uh, where did you get the idea? I wasn't ready for that question, Liza. Uh, That's a good question. So I took a year off. I took a sabbatical off of the bakery. And, and uh, I wasn't that involved with Parallel. I was uh, a little, but not in the operations. And um, my brother and I, after working together for 25 years, agreed to uh, set, take a year off. And I kind of raised my hand. And for some reason, he was happy that I'll take the year off. And uh, he was happy to, to run the company. And I was happy to dabble in other things. So uh, after, I'd say, three or four months of uh, banging my head against the wall and uh, figuring out what the hell. And this kind of co- co- coincided with uh, COVID also, because it happened last March. Um, kind of podcasting, uh, talking to interesting people fascinates me. I do that anyways. And uh, I wanted to try uh, this. It's funny because honestly, everybody and their sister has a podcast. <laughs> it was like, it didn't, it makes no sense. And it's not logical to add another podcast, but uh, we decided to do it anyways. I'm happy Liza said yes, because uh, I really uh, enjoy time with her. And um, our, so far, our, our, as I said, our guests were really, really interesting. So I think it will get, get more interesting, uh, even if, if it can. So when you say you were banging your head against the wall, why? Like, what prompts that? Because you've obviously been in the business for a really long time. And even prior to that, you, you worked. Um, yeah. so was it the, the free time all of a sudden, was it the, like, how was yeah, that it's, it's, transition? Was, I, th- I think it was free time. I really like to create. I I'm it's in my, it's almost my hands shake as if uh, when I'm not creating something and, uh, and learning and doing something, uh, when, I, when we have the bakery and things got into, I don't say monotonous, uh, rhythm because it's never monotonous. It's always very, very active and dynamic. Uh, but um, still the element of creation diminishes as a business grows. Mm. And I think that element was missing. So I, I, part of this would be uh, the podcast. I've written a book uh, about, I guess, kind of a memoir. And again, who the hell wants to read a memoir about me? Uh, but I think it, it, it will be in an interesting one. And, um, and, and kind of, yeah, just that the, the desire to create. So it, it's not almost why and who and logical. It's I, I want to create and do and meet people and hopefully it sticks. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll move into the format that we use for Upfront Toronto, which is a series of questions that's going to cover career, personal, city related questions, and then a quick fire. And so we'll start with that. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Okay. So what was your first job? Okay. So there are several. Um, as a young kid, I, I uh, really uh, wanted money and I wanted, so one of the things was uh, cleaning my parents' house for, I don't remember how much. Uh, then I tried uh, to, my friend wanted to sell his bicycle and he was too shy to sell it. So I said, give it to me, I'm gonna sell it for you. So I said, took his bike and I went to the local bike fixer, upper, and. And I think it was, this was back in Israel. So it was, I think, I don't, don't remember. I wanted, he wanted 150 shekels. I said, okay, I'm going to charge 170 shekels. And um, I went over there and asked the guy if he wants to buy a bike. And uh, at the time, I don't think that there was a lot of bike theft at the time. So uh, long story short, one of the guys there heard me uh, asking that. And he said, I want to. He said, how much? I said, 170 shekels. He said, okay. So I was, he said, come back uh, tomorrow. I'll have the money, bring the bike. I'm, that was easy. That was really easy. Did you wonder and, why you uh, didn't ask for more? No, well, I, he, he's paying 170. So my friend was getting 150 and the 20 were for me. Yeah. So I said, that was easy, 20. Uh, so the next day came and I walked over and I was like, I don't know how young. I was maybe 14 or 13. I'm sure. I don't remember. So what is shekels? Like give for those of Shekel, us that don't know, oh, like how much? Is- I don't remember, honestly. Oh, okay. Uh, but did it's, it feel like, like a lot to you at that age? It was a lot. So yeah, okay. if you think about maybe uh, maybe 150 shekel were $50. So okay. maybe I could make 10 bucks at the time for okay. a 13-year-old that doesn't make money. That was, yeah, that's sweet for no work. Yeah. 
And then the guy came and uh, we, I met the, him there and I wasn't sure if he arrived, but he did. And he gives me the money and takes the bike and I count the money. It's an 150 shekel. And I'm, excuse me, this is, this is not what we agreed on. And he's, well, take it or leave it. <laughs> I was shocked. And unprepared. Your first, your first lesson first, in negotiation. My Yes. So I got, uh, I, and I was at that point so shocked. And I promised my friend the money. And I said, uh, like in my mind, because of the surprise, and I guess that's, I don't know, tactic or something. Um, I said, okay. I mumbled, okay. And off he went. And I gave my friend the 150 shekels and I was left with nothing uh, uh, other than a lesson. So you were left um, with a good lesson. <laughs> yes. It, I didn't learn much from that lesson. It takes usually more than one lesson for me. Uh, that, that was another job. And then when we uh, arrived in Canada, I was 16. And um, the first job was actual, actual job was uh, being a dishwasher in a, a deli. So um, washing, washing pots and pans and uh, smelling like uh, brisket when uh, the evening mm. ended. Yeah, it was a great turn on. The great. <laughs> chase me on the way home. Yeah. Okay. So where did you get the idea for the business? And I'm talking Ozeri Bakery. I do want to get into Parallel Brothers as well, but let's start with Ozeri Bakery. Yeah. So Ozeri Bakery. Um, so I'm half uh, Yemenite, Jewish, Israeli, and my Yemenite family was of Orthodox, um, was Orthodox. And our grandmother and, and aunt used to bake breads for the family in gathery, in family gatherings on weekends and all. And I just love that process of making bread. And I, I would stand there looking at them, mixing the dough, the dough rising, and then them making round balls and it rise again. And then they flatten it and put it in this kind of cool pan. And then you peek through a hole looking at the dough rising. And it's magical because pitas kind of rise up and become like a ball full of hot steam. And then everybody wants the smell kind of uh, left the, the bowl and or the, the baking pan and everybody would, would be attracted to that kitchen area to taste fresh bread. And at times they put some za'atar and olive oil on it or pizza or whatnot, and then it would be even better. And I, so I learned how to make dough and, and pita and I really enjoyed that. And uh, so that was also a young age, maybe 15. And I carried that over to when I went to Ryerson doing a hospitality and business management. And I wrote a business plan uh, that was kind of combining the pita making and Subway sandwiches and the bagel craze at the time. So it was, let's make a variety of pita breads that have different flavors, uh, serving really healthy sandwiches. And that, that was for the store. And um, yeah, that's how it started. And so and that, when that you so the business plan started, my father asked me if I want to go in business together, and I owed twenty five thousand dollars to OSAP. We were not wealthy at all. Our father and mother were not either, and um, they were willing to put in their only fifty thousand dollars at age sixty, and um, and uh, start a business with a very inexperienced uh, young guy. Uh, so yeah. That's so when he asked you to, you know, because usually it's the other way around, kids go to the parents and ask them for money. Um, when he asked you to go into business, did you did you have the confidence to do that? Like, did you, how how did how did that feel? I wrote the uh, I wrote the business plan and I was talking about it. I, I didn't think to ask him just because I didn't think they have money. I knew they didn't. This like right. literally was their only fifty thousand dollars for for their retirement, which right. wouldn't last long. And um, but when you I didn't wrote think about plan, it. I didn't think I was just I was making pita for fun. Yeah, I wrote the plan, the plan for fun, just because I wanted to see how the concept would be. And, you know, let's do what can I do now? Right. I can I can write the business plan. I can make the pita. I can figure out that and then we'll see what happens. Right. And uh, then my father kind of said, hey, do you know what you want to do it together? And I was, of course. And he was an insurance broker. OK. And um He's very talented and very optimistic. And um, those were things that, that definitely needed, we needed. So if he hadn't asked you, do you think you would have, you would have tried it through other means or? That's that a very good spark? question. Yeah. So I, uh, I, uh, I knew I wanted to go into food, which God knows why, but I uh, went to work at, at Canada's Wonderland because I knew I wanted to go into food and to meet people and to get experience. 
So fairly quickly, I became an area manager in the park, look, overlooking the restaurants uh, and the food facilities. And uh, who knows, maybe I would have gone into uh, chain stores or God knows what. But um, you I know didn't. my father the last year, I, but I didn't. Yeah, it, didn't. it was fun. It were really good people. And it was really, really good experience before uh, jumping in myself. Yes. I mean, I washed dishes and I, I did. I was a deli. I managed the deli at night, so I got some experience, but very, very small anecdotal scale. Right. So, and then, and then now there's Parallel Brothers. So just if you can give us a quick background on, because yes. you did it once and I thought you promised yourself you wouldn't do it again, and then you decided to do it again. So what prompted Parallel Brothers and of course, bringing your other brothers, Guy and Aaron into it as well. So it's very much yeah. a family affair. Definitely. And it wasn't necessarily me bringing them into it. It was kind of a very collaborative uh, experience. Mm. And uh, I told my ex-wife to shoot me in the head next time we open a restaurant. Uh, and, and thankfully, she, she didn't. And, uh, but we saw, I saw this big stone mill in a market in Jerusalem that uh, milled sesame seed in front of your eyes. And it was mesmerizing. I, you know, I, I recorded it and it was on my phone. And I'm like, wouldn't that be cool if we have that in Toronto? And um, I showed it to my brothers and they're, yeah, well, this would be really cool. And uh, then, then kind of uh, our, our third brother, who was an artist in Berlin for the longest time, um, came back to Canada with his family. And uh, we decided we just kind of sitting together and talking and say, this, the idea came up. Why don't we make a, a, a brand, a sesame uh, butter brand and make a, have a restaurant component to it that will introduce sesame butter to Canadians? Because they're, you know, all they know right now is the white kind of watery dressing that goes on falafels and shawarmas, but it's so much more diverse and there's so much more to, to do with it. So we all got excited. Our youngest brother, who's uh, two and a half years younger than I am, um, said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And we we're okay. So figure it out. We found a location at Geary, which was really awesome, is awesome. Um, beautiful industrial, 2,700 uh, square foot building. Uh, next to Portuguese garages and a gym and, and a Portuguese bakery and uh, just beautiful. I really love that street. And, uh, and we yeah, and things started there. Well, and Geary, what a Geary is today. Geary was probably not three years ago. So did you have the insight that it was going to change into something more? Um... Yeah, I, 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 did, I don't know if I had the insight that Geary will become as popular. I mean, it still had it had the uh, Blood Brothers, which are an awesome brewery. Yeah. Um, Leo from, from Familia Baldazare was there just starting. He, he still he was just initial. Uh, he didn't have the name he has today yet. And um, then we came. So I think uh, that kind of lifted, uh, the three of us lifted the street. And I mean, today they're just, uh, yeah. thankfully, not that many new places. So it still uh, has its uh, uniqueness to it. And um so I didn't think the street would become something. I thought it would be, a, it would have to be a destination. So it's not as if people are walking outside and, right. and they walk in just because they see a cool place, they'll need to know about it. And, um, you know, thankfully we, we did a good job with the food and uh, the restaurant became really busy quickly. Um, to, I, I didn't want it to become that busy that fast. I wanted uh, to focus more on the brand and the sesame butter and developing products. And that being kind of a manufactory, so making products and then getting them all around the neighborhood and all. But um, I mean, the restaurant really killed it. So um, we're fortunate about that. Yeah. And that now, these days, we're focusing now more on the wholesale element and manufacturing really, really good products that have sesame seed or sesame butter in them. Right. Okay. So in under 10 words, what was the best advice that you received and that you've also given? So I'd say um, it, I kind of had two answers. So I don't follow <laughs> rules or, or instructions that well. One was I was washing the, the, the window outside. I was washing the window outside uh, that store 20 some odd years ago. Which was then I, Peter Break. You're talking about which the, was, like the... which was Peter Break. Okay. Yes. And 
we were contemplating, are we going to go? We had a, a restaurant that was fairly busy at the time, actually really busy, but we didn't charge enough money. So it wasn't that profitable. So we were working really hard. People thought we were doing great, but we were doing meh. And uh, we we're what's next? Do we open another store? Do we go into catering or do we start wholesaling our products? And I didn't know, like, I honestly didn't know. And this customer of ours, Jonathan, uh, who I really evaluated, really smart guy was standing next to me uh, as I washing the window. And he's, uh, you know, Alon, and I, I, I shared my, um, my kind of, uh, fr not frustration, but questioning. And he's, Alon, go into wholesale. It's much harder to get in there but once you're in it's more stable and and that was the reason we went in and I know catering is just a, a, such a hard job and I, it really shortened my life and uh, another restaurant would be also it's fairly really hard uh, I mean a wholesale business is also really hard so I, I don't know if there was the right answer but that's what I took um, today what I would tell people is Grow, and I just want to, I just going to, I'm just going to jump in because you deal a lot with entrepreneurs, you mentor entrepreneurs, you've worked with organizations that help entrepreneurs. Yes. So yes. it's very much your wheelhouse, um, that, that sort of space and landscape, the startups. Yeah. The I, I got so much help, uh, from random people at the beginning that I'm so, I really want to share if I can, if words that I say can help people in a decision or skip a learning, uh, you know, kind of a steep learning curve, uh, makes me happy. And so, so yes, uh, there's youth employment services, uh, biz start program that I've been involved in for a while. And, uh, we have every year we, we give a tour to the students there or the young entrepreneurs and, uh, they all have a business plan and they're launching a business. And honestly, I, I got so many good friends out of that plan, out of that program, both people who, who volunteer and both who work and who were taking the course. So I, I think I benefited more than I put in definitely. And so what advice would you give them? I sort of took you off track there, but yes, what so advice do you give the, these young entrepreneurs, today, older entrepreneurs? I would give anyone in business is to um, a have a strong brand, invest in your brand and then let the world know what you're doing. I mean, not the secrets, not the trade secrets, but it's the people that you attract and the people that you, that, that you get in, enthusiastic about your, your, your uh, brand will do a lot of work for you. And the, the strength of community is, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how strong it would be, um, how strong it is. I was very solo. Uh, I have to do it myself. I have to succeed myself. And every time, but every time I hired someone or brought someone in who took over a job and I kind of moved up, it was the best thing I've ever done. So it's letting go a little and also um, have, having this community where you, you, you communicate with and send out the messages and let the universe help you a little. You don't right. have to carry everything yourself. Right, right. So when you say focus on the brand, can you just explain that a little to someone who's listening that's like brand, like that seems like such a... It's like this big word, but what does it Elusive. actually, yeah, like it does, what yes. does it actually mean? How do you focus on the brand? I, I mean, when you open Peter Break many, many, because I think it's going to be the, it's, it's 25 years or something like it's, it's got to be. Yes, yes, yes. 25 you know, years. Around there, uh, you know, mm. there was no social media. We didn't have cell phones the way we do today. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a different landscape now. But when you say mm -hmm. brand to those that are starting out that may not have a budget for um, focusing that heavily on the brand. Can you just give us in like a quick yeah, snapshot? So, so what basically that means? the brand is knowing what your business is and then all the realms around it communicate that. So, so you need to communicate in a certain way, the words you use, the graphics you use, everything you do uh, with the business communicates something. And, and, uh, the brand you need to sit and have a brand proposition. Know what your what your company or product or service stand for, and then make sure that all the communications at every level, even how you dress, even how you present yourself, how your your team uh, represent themselves, how they carry themselves, what they say, uh, your, your your graphics, your your homepage, everything uh, needs to work together. And it's so important just because recipes can be copied, services can be copied, and you can have two companies doing the exact same thing. But the company that 
communicates better with the consumer and, and there's a kind of an alignment between the promise and, the, and what they get. So their, the customer expectation, if they get there and they get what they thought they'd get, fantastic. If they get there and they get a little more than what they thought they get, even better. And it has to be done with full awareness. And, um, and I think that's, uh, that's what I would recommend uh, any younger entrepreneur is that to, to focus on that is how they communicate, what they communicate, and what is the message that you want to uh, be known for and as. Okay. And so what is your source of inspiration? What or who or, yeah, wh where does that come from? On, I don't know. That's a, <laughs> it's a, I know we have this question in there and uh, I, I like, I love doing, I love, uh, I love seeing people being happy. I love pleasing people. And um, I also like enjoying myself. I like uh, the odd holiday here and there. And, and I like going to restaurants and meeting people and all that inspires me. So whatever can allow me um, have that lifestyle is, is, is kind of my inspiration. I don't necessarily have a specific person um, as my inspiration, uh, but it's more, more but, of uh, the lifestyle I want is inspiring me. Right. Are there companies though, just because I've, I've known you for a little while now, and when you would come back from a holiday, you would generally bring an idea with you. There would be something you saw, something, you know, whether you were in a market, whether you ate in a restaurant and, and you'd want to bring that and, and you know, breathe your own life into it into it oh man yeah so um i think when traveling uh it allows you to break from the routine and the stresses of the day-to-day -day, and that's uh, i think crucial for development and then it's almost like you walk around and you open up like a 3d kind of flower uh and and you're you're looking not only with your eyes you're sensing you're feeling and and you're looking or you're not even looking you just uh notice things and then you kind of mark them and you buy either buy them or take a photo of them and, and then keep them in your memory bank. And then as you daydream and walk down the street, or as I daydream and walk down the street, those, those components kind of start attaching to each other and, um, and then they come out as ideas and then I'll write them down and see, you know, I, 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 when I get back, I would play, play around with stuff like that. Right. But it could be a market. It could be, you know, tartine bread in San Francisco. What, what a, an amazing place. And their old place was at the corner of the street there and line up standing uh, of people standing along the stores waiting to get in. Wow. Like I wasn't used to those stand, the, those lineups here in Toronto at the time. And now they opened a, a new place, which is also gorgeous. Um, there, there are a few brands, Blue Bottle, which was like amazing coffee and minimalistic graphics and just a beautiful uh, product also um, anything and I mean a beach in Maui could be inspiring also and and bring all those thoughts together eventually yeah and also the street in Toronto I mean I love Toronto parks I love walking in the city and and uh, checking out new places and and they all I, they all kind of press different buttons within my uh, mind and and uh, See, see, you never know what, what comes out of it. And a lot of time, nothing comes out of it too. Well, there's always something. It just maybe not percolate into anything in particular, but it all creates, you know, what it is that you are and how you decide to share that, whether it's through food or any, any source of inspiration. So what would you consider to be your biggest career achievement? Uh, I, I don't think about, our business like that but you know when you have guests that come and visit the bakery uh you know how you see things through their eyes and it's always uh, it blows me it blows my mind like uh, i had uh, david uh, dave matacchioni um after our interview and i said hey come to the bakery like for a long time he wanted to see it and he's walking around looking at everything and the machinery and that and he was on oh, this is outstanding and just seeing the place through a new pair of eyes uh, reminds me of what we've achieved. So I think that's bloody unbelievable. And, um, but in the day to day, I, I don't notice that at all. I, I always see what's not okay and what we need to do and what's to be achieved. Right. Right. And, and yeah, and even, even parallel like that, I'm really proud of what we did there that cause, cause, uh, people who come in, we, it's a, such a unique space and, um, our brother, Aaron, who runs it, and, and um, 
he, he, he's also an artist, as I said, and he created, uh, it's, it's a lot of it, if not all of it is him, the, the vibe and the feel. And he did such a good job and people just love coming there. He said, I don't feel like I'm in Toronto. I feel like I'm somewhere else. And, and it's so uh, unique. And, and I agree with it. I, I still, I go there several times a week and I, I love that, that space and the feel and what we give people and the people that work there with us. It's, uh, it's unique. Yeah. And parallel is always evolving. Every, every time I go there, there's something different. Something's moved, something's changed, something's been added or taken away. So there's this element of this newness all the time, something it's, it's kind of a fluid transformation into something else. So, mm -hmm. and I, I would assume that that's the artistic side of air in that that is constantly that too, and, looking to and also the business element. Yeah, yeah. Like there is always, we're looking to what, what can we do now? What's interesting? What's tasty? What, right. what else can we do with sesame butter? And right. then it will move things around. And, and uh, you know, we had COVID, so we have nobody inside. Now it's almost a warehouse plus a, a production uh, line or a manufacturing uh, space because we're making a lot of stuff out of there. Right, right. And, you know, going back to Ozeri, I remember the times where YES would visit Youth Employment Services. Uh, mm -hmm. a lot of young entrepreneurs that are just starting out and for them to see where something could lead to. Uh, I just remember them being wide eyed and just being yeah, like, yeah. wow, you know, this is, this is really possible. Um, and that was, you know, that was, that's, that's huge. That's huge because, you know, we don't know how we go on to affect others. So. No, you know, Liza, it's, I, I still don't know either, but mm -hmm. I almost always end that tour of the bakery uh, with, you know what, guys, and they're all at the beginning, they're be be anywhere between mm -hmm. 18 and 29, and they're all written a business plan, launching a very young business, and sometimes not from the you know uh, backgrounds that have all the resources for them sure. to succeed. That's why, that, that's why it exists. And I, I told them every time I tell them, guys and girls and ladies, um, I never thought we would achieve what we achieved. And I was an average student and nothing didn't excel in anything really. And um, I never expected that we'd get this far with what you see here. So, but what, what, what I did know is what I love to do and I love to create and I just give me that ability to create and that. And I think also for me, the, the um, winning, winning combination was my brother and I, and my father and I initially, but then my brother and I, uh, where we complemented each other and because um, I by myself I'm not that structured and and uh, all the, the, the big lines and and systems are not my forte and uh, I think that's what kind of you know you need luck also it's not always uh, a lot of times it's we're just a, a, an element within the success right so success is success and that's wonderful we all love hearing those stories but the curious ones are the failures where, so what, what would you consider one of the biggest failures? Because I think it's important to include that. It's not all cupcakes and sprinkles. Um, no, no. Actually, you know, it's funny. I, I have an uncle who owns a, a day camp, which you may ha happen to know. He may be a, you know, a relative of two of us. And uh, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. More proof. And um <laughs> He says, he says, like he every day is worried his business won't exist the next day or the next week. And I was the same and I am the same. I don't take it for granted. I honestly, um, now that I'm in, in sabbatical, it's a little different. But uh, when I worked, I was always worried about what could happen. And I don't love that feeling, but it existed. And uh, it was definitely, I think people are divided into two groups. One group is those who freeze when they're uh, facing adversity and the others kind of, okay, let's go and see what we can do and, um, and just do things. And uh, I, I, my brother and I definitely belong to the second group is when there's adversity or even perceived adversity, usually there was real adversity. Um, it's what can we do and go and do it and go plant more seeds and more seeds for new beginnings and go uh, become more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then, you know, once all is done, you know, there were threats, some, some happened, some didn't, and the, some seeds grew to be successes and some, um, 
yeah, and, and, and just kind of, you never know, but if you do enough things that are creative and, and uh, move things forward, you know, they'll work. So do you have an example that, that you can share that shows that, you know, failure turned, you know, can, you know, remained a failure or failure turned into something that produced a seed that then produced something else? Um, we were once kicked out of a small chain and when we were really early on and so I it was thought, a big deal. That was a big, deal. I thought it was the end. <laughs> <laughs> we, I thought it was the end several times. We had, I had so many, uh, the one was one, yeah, we were kicked out of a small chain and it was, we, that was big for us. And I thought, oh my God, um, we're done. Others will kick, uh, get rid of us too. And we just kept on plugging and plugging and plugging. And then eventually they came back also there, there, uh, people wanted us back in. Uh, we Can were you going... share why you were kicked out? Like, was there something uh, that... a, a, comp a competitor started okay. making a uh, similar product and, and they had better coverage and they were bigger, okay. way bigger than us and all that. Um, the same thing happened in the U S we were ready to go into the U S with this really new and innovative, uh, one bun and, um, about a few, couple of months before we're ready to launch it, even though we invested in a factory, a whole new factory and took millions of dollars in loans. Um, we found out that this product is in the U S and it's new and it spread and by a much bigger bakery. And, oh my God, that was also, a, I thought we lost everything and, uh, we almost did, but you know, you bounce back. It kind of pushed us to reevaluate, uh, who we are and, uh, look at our, uh, uh, basically, we, we kind of doubled down on we're all natural. We're not using chemicals. We're not a large company. We're a smaller niche company, but we make really, really good products. So uh, differentiating, again, uh, differentiating yourself. Yeah. And consumers notice the difference. So yes, yes we're not that uh, multi, multi, whatever company, but within our, we're a niche of a niche within bread. And so it's already challenging as it is. And bre also bread is such a challenge to sell because uh, a lot of people, kind of turned away from it and we're fighting an uphill battle there. So you need to be authentic and have a good brand and a good communication, good right. communication with consumers and good, uh, you know, you need to meet your promises and expectations. So all that, all that we, and more. All that and more. So do you, do you actually sleep at night? Before I, I go into I my didn't. next question. <laughs> um, yeah, there's always a reason not to sleep. So, right. So how do you I handle stress? Them particularly when it's not going well, like, is there yes. an activity you do? Is there, well, how do you, how do you do? This? So uh, we're, we're in COVID now. And uh, unfortunately, swimming pools were shut down. So I used to swim three or four times a week, and it was magical. I'd enter uh, the pool on one end, as I started, and I was so bad in swimming initially, I was like, I swim 10 minutes, and I was dead. But with time and um, practice, I got to maybe 40, 50 minutes. And uh, that was perfect. As with anything, and it's practice. Yes, yes. It yeah, yeah, exactly. Practice. Yeah. And uh, sticking to it. You know how many times I didn't want to go to the pool? How many times? Every other time I didn't want to go to the pool. I know. Because you're like, I understand. It's minus 20 degrees outside, minus 10, zero, 10, whatever. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, I don't want to go. But I just it kind of, my body was automatic. I, I kind of took myself out of the decision-making and let my body routine take me there. Mm -hmm. And within, suddenly I find myself in my bathing suit getting into the water and I didn't want to get into the water because it's colder and all that. But within five to 10 minutes, when I get, you get into the zone and kind of, and then you go in, I, I like, this was countless times where I entered with both personal issues and business issues and within 10, 15 minutes, everything disappeared. Water has a way of doing that. Of the swimming and the stroking and, and just I'm going through the water that I didn't fight the thoughts. I let them. They were... <laughs> yes. Right. No, I can relate. I, I like a monotony. So yeah, yeah I, can, I yours, can relate just in the sense that I have a morning routine where I get up and I, I do my, you know, my stretches, some meditation, some breath work. But I'm lying in bed thinking of how I can get out of it. What, what can I do to get in my own head? And the only person. So you want to stay in bed? That's the it's thing. not that I want to stay in bed. I want to get up. I want to do stuff. But I'm trying to figure out how do I get out of doing, which I think, Lisa, just get up and do it. Just, you know, there's no, because it's only beneficial. 
it's really only beneficial. So, and I always wonder why, why, why do I do that? Like, why do people do that? So it's, I'm slightly comforted in knowing <laughs> that it's not just me. And that but to me, it's to do it, even if it's not beneficial, like it's actually, if it's not beneficial, I, I develop the skill to go through shit. And even if it's not nice and not that I have to do it, I'll have to do it and I'll do it, go through it, go through it. And then there are patterns, you know, yeah. uh, that you go through and, um, now, now it's cycling. So uh, in the winter, I did ice skating. So I'd ice skate uh, like a maniac. And uh, now I cycle and walk. So there's always a, the element of movement. Right, right. So back to so business for, before for, we... For you, it's more meditative and yes. inward, right? Yes, inward, yeah, I think quiet. I'd go crazy if I did that, yeah. <laughs> no, I need to... St- like the stilling of the mind never used to make sense to me. Now it is very clear to me the importance of that Mm -hmm. just before the day begins and before things start to inundate. Uh, So let's just two more questions before we move to personal. Um, Who's your favorite competitor? And I know you've mentioned a couple, but do you have any in Toronto that you, I mean, you've mentioned Tartine in San Francisco, but let's stick, stick to Toronto. And I like Blackbird. They make really good breads, Mm -hmm. really, really good breads. Um, ba, 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 bam. Stone Mill make good breads. Who else? You know, I should be prepared for these questions, but uh, I love I love uh, uh, David's uh, sourdough bread. They're outstanding. Matakionis, yeah. outstanding. Uh, there's a new bakery called Lev. Uh, Yoni Camille, he's uh, uh, he used to be the baker at uh, Blackbird, and he's doing making now uh, rye breads, which are amazing. Okay, so it's a pretty good I love insight. the pizzas at uh, Bar Neon. They make actually good sourdough uh, buns too. So yes, all around good work. So where do you see now, apart from COVID, because that I know has changed the landscape for a lot of businesses, um, if not all businesses. Uh, where do you see the business? Ozeri, we'll start with Ozeri. Where do you see Ozeri in five years? Because although you're on a sabbatical, you're still involved and you're still Mm -hmm. part of that vision. So, yeah. So uh, Ozeri now has, uh, we made our uh, super seed crunch, which is a keto product. So it's a no uh, wheat product. I love wheat, by the way. I love, Mm -hmm. I just love wheat. I, I, um, it does me good. And, um, but this uh, super seed I think uh, has a lot of potential in going into really having healthy snacks around there. Yeah. Based with uh, based on seeds and a mix of seeds and really innovative products in there. Uh, it's, it always needs to be tasty for me. It can't be like, I won't, I will not vote for the healthy, healthy, but uh, you know, cardboard esque have, have all the right <laughs> ingredients there, but it, you don't get that satisfaction of mm, like, ah, I'm feeling a little better now. Uh, and it's not even the matter of the carbs, it's just that love kind of element that we need. Yeah. And um, so I think it has that. So I think there's huge potential there. I don't want to be, I don't want us to be like a multinational in any way. I don't think we, we ever will. So it's not, it's, what's pushing is not necessarily to be bigger, but definitely to have a good relationship with our communities. Uh, we have a really good program, um, B Corp, which is a very, environmental and and uh people uh oriented i'm really proud about that uh, i want our our team members to make more money i like to have better um programs for them so that's a goal that both my brother and i share and um yeah be better employers all, all yeah. around so yeah. that's definitely a goal wonderful and what about parallel where do you see parallel because there, parallel there's the manufacturing side yeah. there's the restaurant side so it's yeah yeah yeah, so the restaurant, I don't want to grow. I want it to be the size that it is and stay on Giri and that's it. We don't want any more restaurants, but we love this one. This one is so special. Um, the rest is to, um, I guess, sell our sesame butters and sesame butter-based products uh, across North America and uh, teach Canadians and kind of introduce sesame butter to Canadians. It is so good. Like sometimes at night uh, when I'm home and I'm lazy and I make a salad, but you know, a salad isn't enough. And you know, I, sometimes I have a pizza and a salad or something, but what you can do is just take a salad, a really good salad, throw in some tuna in there and then, and, and crunchy, crunchy carrots and, and red uh, onion and good vinaigrette on there. 
and doesn't have to be complicated. You can cut an egg in half, leave, have that there, and then drizzle on it the sesame butter, but the kind of the original one, the one we sell. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the beauty of the sesame butter, it just gives it this nuttiness and it mixes up with the vinaigrette and, and, you're, and, and it's filling and it's healthy and you feel so good after you eat it and you're not hungry. Well, and the so creamy, just, the creamy element creaminess is so and, satisfying. Yeah. Creamy is satisfying. Yeah. Yes. And, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, and then uh, the Humera seeds that we use, they're not bitter. So they have a, we source these seeds out of a certain area in Ethiopia, which, uh, you know, most tahinis don't have because sometimes they're price based. Right. And it just gives you that lovely flavor to it. And uh, yeah. All right. So we'll move to personal. We'll just kind of skim through them because I'm conscious of time as mm. well. But where were you born? Yes. This, this is an interesting question. <laughs> I was born, I, I know nobody knows this because they always guess. First of all, people always guess that I'm, I'm either French by the accent and because I don't have a heavy Israeli accent or they think of an English speaking country that they don't know. And for some reason, Irish comes up sometimes. I don't know why. Really? Maybe, yeah, I, I, no, I don't know. Maybe they just don't know. Um, but so we were born, I was born in, uh, in, in Toronto at Women's College Hospital. Uh, my mother is, uh, was um, a British, young British nurse uh, who came to Toronto with a bunch of her nurse friends on the Queen Mary and uh, looking nice. for work and fun in Toronto. And our father was, is a Yemenite, uh, uh, Jewish Yemenite, uh, uh, I guess, uh, background who escaped Orthodox uh, background and he didn't connect with religion at all. And they met in Toronto, so two different faiths. And uh, they had three kids here. And then they went back to Israel when I was three. And we came back here at 16 and we came and da, da, da. And I ended up here at 21. And, um, and then that's when I went to Ryerson. So long, okay. long answer for a short question. So, so the, the accent or the slight something that people can't detect is the moving to Israel when you were three. Yeah, and having a British a, a British mother and, and having the British influence. I mean, we were in England often, almost every summer. Right. So it's a Canadian, English, Israeli mixture. Yeah. And you'll notice as the audience listens that there is the odd British word that sneaks in. Um, and you'll notice it when it actually happens. So what you were know, some it's funny when we came to Canada when I was 16, uh, I couldn't say tomato, tomato because it was tomato like how yeah. why are you ruining this name it's tomato and all of you are using tomato and today it's like today my it's a mishmash of accents and even hebrew and english are mishmashed together i'll say a, a sentence in english but it would actually be uh, translated from hebrew and vice versa i'll speak hebrew and i'll translate from english so it's kind of a mess it's a clusterfuck so when you're in england and you're with your cousins do you start to speak more english like more english accent do you take that Liza, on or is it just in I'm a going, mocking way? <laughs> I'm going to top that. Uh, so obviously I mock my cousins because they're, they have a very upper class British accent. Uh, they live in Brighton and uh, it's fun to, to do that. But you know, there are people who, so even I, if I'll sit in an in a Uber uh, and, and take a ride somewhere and I start talking to, let's say the Indian driver, my accent will get Indian. <laughs> by the end of the drive oh, no you're one of those <laughs> i am and it's done unintentionally when i speak to an ethiopian lady uh, who works at the bakery my english becomes ethiopian accent with very quickly so uh, it's not done on purpose i really try not to do that because um it, it, it may seem as if i'm mocking them and it really isn't it's just i don't know i just yes. try to yeah it's, i uh, think there have been scientific studies on that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because my brother has very, a very talented, smart people. Do yes, that. that's what happens. My <laughs> brother has a friend who would do that. My dad has a very thick Italian accent. And mm -hmm. this friend of my brother's, who's very Canadian, when he's around him within a few hours, he's starting to speak this kind of sort of like broken English. English, Italian. We're like, what are you doing? what are you doing? But he just takes it on. And it is, it's, I think it actually has been studied that people actually do that. So there you go. Maybe you could be part of a study. I have a question though. Your accent, where would you pin, pin your accent as? Do you think you have an accent? No. 
So I, I think you have like the Italian kind of a vibe to your English, but it could be my imagination just because I know you. Yeah, I think Did I think the Italian or? sometimes comes out. Sometimes the Italian. I mean, if will I tie out, your but... hands and don't let and you talk, it would be a problem, right? It would be. A... It would be a problem. I'm trying to keep them folded in my lap like I was taught in school, but it's not easy. <laughs> so what, did, what, what traits did you inherit from your parents? Uh, they, they were opposites and um, like complete opposites. I was more like my mother when I was younger. She was more introverted and very British, very and uh but she was fighting it also because she ended up marrying a brown jewish guy so <laughs> <laughs> i could imagine uh seeing her family getting the news the first day and uh what a kerfuffle that that may have caused uh they by the way they were all great with us and there were no issues but you know they came from a very very uh white village in in upper class uh, England in and France. back then so, it would have been more like then, nowadays yeah. particularly in Toronto I think it's you know it's not yeah, a here it's already deal. nothing but 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 back then in those days um yeah you didn't that was probably yeah, yeah. very unusual to their credit they were honestly our English family is amazing and we're very yeah. close so amazing. uh I was more like my mother and as time progressed uh, my father our father is very um he loves people he loves food he loves life he is uh yeah, yeah just a, a unique uh, person and uh I'm becoming more like him not in the uniqueness but more in the love for life and love for food and and for people uh, you know my own style but uh, definitely less uh, introverted. Right. And what key lessons did you learn from them? So I think my father's positivity, he's, mm. he's like the most positive person there is. I was more negative to start with, but realistic. So it actually kind of helped me. Um, I got that. I think our mother, she was very artistic. She painted and I, I got that element. And I think it helps with with creating and with feeling energy and mm. kind of uh, having that sixth sense for things. So I, I think I got that from her. Okay. And as a teenager, what was the dumbest thing you, you ever did as a teenager? I was such a boring kid. It's unbelievable. It was. Okay, so in your adult life, because I do have slosh adult. The, the, the adult life I, I can't made made up for the, the teen years. I was ridiculous as a teenager. I'm embarrassed to say I have. Yeah, no, but, no good. Uh, I did silly things. I, you know what? The silliest thing I remember <laughs> during my uh, I kind of coming out process. So um, seven years ago, eight years ago. Uh, so eight years ago, I came out to my wife and three kids. So that wasn't a small thing, as you can imagine. And I'd say seven or eight years preceded to that. There was the, from the moment I knew that I was inauthentic with myself at first, because I, I knew it inside, but I didn't, but I didn't. It's kind of weird to describe how those things happen. And uh, then seven years were, there was that struggle. And, and, and then a lot of it, um, I guess, act, I acted it out with heavy drinking and, 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 and doing silly things. Um, but I, re I remember we got, got trashed once and I'm mid thirties <laughs> and uh, I don't know, we're so drunk and the subway doors opened and I was on the subway because I was, and then I threw up out of those doors uh -huh. and then they closed and then <laughs> I have thrown up at a couple stops and I, I'm embarrassed to say that that happened, but that happened. And uh, yeah, does, does that answer your question? Is that that answers example? my question. And yes, you're definitely making up for it in adult life then. <laughs> I did, yeah. Now I'm calming down again, I think, uh, as, as everything is settling. And do you, think, is settling. do you think that sort of acting out, whatever, whatever anyone wants to call it, is attributed to the inauthentic living? Or Definitely. My, okay. Mine was. So it's tied, it's linked. Mine, I was so su suppressing everything, um, good old Victorian uh, kind of mm. education, which can, I kind of skipped down a generation to me. And I was, I guess, uh, really uh, received it with open arms to just be good, be good. What do other people think? Be, do what you're expected. And, and that's, that kind of guided me as a kid and as a teenager. And it didn't, was, wasn't a great 
childhood. I mean, it was a good childhood, but not, uh, I, I put on myself that, uh, those restrictions. Um, did you know you I, were putting those restrictions on? No, no, no. Okay. No. So it was my, was I guess within my, yeah, it was in my characteristic or something to please and stuff like that. Right. And, um, it just happened. And then as time progressed, that kind of, uh, I think the, uh, the authentic self began to, to rise and, um, and then when that happened, that's when shit happens. That's when mm. uh, alcohol is used. A lot of alcohol is used and, and silly yeah. behavior, uh, emerges. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I took what was a landmark that was really a good course for me and kind of helped me with authenticity. Um, you know, I, I'm not connected to them in any way, but that course helped me a lot. So when you took that course, cause I've taken landmark as well. And I, again, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but I do strongly recommend it to people because it does have, so do I. Yeah. Yeah. It does have an impact. It does leave an impression and whether or not you do anything immediately, it, it triggers something in the back of your mind that is always sort of fluttering there. So was I there, think it does it, though, for people that are ready, I think that people that are not ready, it won't. And people, I was ready, I guess. I think for uh, after age 30, between age 30 mm -hmm. and age 50, people, you know, you, th th that all, everything, that trajectory that you were on or in um, begins to lose energy. And then you start to deal with, okay, who am I? And then realizing life doesn't continue forever. And at 40, you're at the, who knows, half of your life. And what you've achieved, you've achieved. And then what else is, so all these questions come by our minds and, and you know, some earlier, some later, but that, I think that kind of is, uh, accelerates that whole process for some, some where it will cause to take action and come out. So I literally came out. I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, I didn't, uh, acknowledge me being gay, but, uh, I, you know, I loved my wife. I, it wasn't black and white at all. And, and, right. um, I had really good, good relationship with her and have an amazing relationship with her today. But um, those inauthenticities started kind of uh, uh, appearing and, and then disrupting, and then they disrupted our relationship. Um, oddly enough, and I haven't been ever with a guy until then. So um, I didn't know. For me, it was all in the head, and it hasn't been a physical thing. So you don't know. At right. least that's how I saw it. So yeah, and then it moved on. Okay. So when you were younger, what did you, what, what did you want to be when you grow up? What was in the, in that young mind? I loved hotels. I loved uh, the, the kind of the, well, you still I think do. That's why I do love hotels still, as a yeah. guest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but, but uh, then I just loved that because we grew up in Israel and it was you know, not, not a first world country. Now it is, but then it was kind of a second world country. And that walking into the lobby was like you're going to another country and you had right. people from another country and smells and perfumes and, you know, people were dressed differently and the energy was different. And I was drawn to that very much. Mm. Um, so I kind of maybe that's what I wanted to do. And I really like serving people. I like providing for people. I like taking care of people. I really like that uh, element. So, um, yes. Yeah. Okay. And your guilty pleasure. I, I suspect you have many. But. I do, yes. <laughs> and they're all oppo opposing to one another. So one is have a day alone and be alone completely and go on walks and look at the trees and contemplate and listen to music. Uh, I need those. And I need uh, wild nights at a restaurant and a bar and music and dancing and all that. Uh, I need that too. So it's a, a fine balance between the two. I love entertaining people like parallel gives me the opportunity to entertain like my friends and colleagues and, and associates. It's just, we, we have so much fun there. I mean, this year we kind of missed that, but I think we're going to have a fuck COVID party on Geary the moment. Street we can. party. So, <laughs> yeah. So my, my yeah. goal is for it to spill over and I'll talk to other, other uh, partners on Geary and try and uh, have a like, a big party where, where we block the street and just enjoy life and, and, and get back to how we should be. Yeah. Cause I really miss uh, that connection with people. So yes. I'm guessing we're now in end of April, 2021. 
I would love to do that maybe by fall. So the weather will still be good and people will be allowed and vaccinated and whatnot to, to do that. So I can't wait for that. Yes, I think you'll have a lot of people jumping on board. Yes, I think this too. has affected people more than, not more than they think, because I pe think people are thinking about it, but there's different aspects that don't necessarily get the time uh, to be reflected upon until you know, you're in a situation where you're enjoying things again. Yeah. It goes so. against human nature. We, we need each other. I need yes. people. Even though I like to say I don't need, need people, I need people. Yeah, for sure. And, and everyone does. Even we need people in order not to like them. Yes. Yes, of course. So if you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Uh, I was, who was I talking? I was talking to my daughter today and I, um, I was like, oh, I wish I could sing. I really wish I could sing well. You hear so, our dog, so Maya's dog in the background. Right. Yeah, so so I wish like I a could rock sing star very... singer or like? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Just be oh. able to carry a tune okay. well. So kill those karaoke nights then. Kill them. Kill them. Okay. I mean, okay. being on stage in front of a thousand, thousands of people that adore you isn't bad. But <laughs> well, you'll take a karaoke night too. <laughs> Singing in the shower. Uh, uh, that's already done. Yes. Okay. So we'll move to city. We'll move to mm -hmm. the city, city related questions. Um, what is your favorite neighborhood? So I lived across the city. I lived everywhere in the city and I truly love many elements. So again, I'm not going to follow your instructions, but uh, I love the West End. I lived on um, DuPont near Lansdowne. Mm -hmm. So just I, I love that vibe and uh, our, our uh, parallel is at Geary so it's also kind of west northwest uh, end which is so unique and wonderful I like the people I like kind of the lay, lay, lay back kind of atmosphere really good coffee good food um, and then there is I'm now in Regent Park which I truly love uh, I just like the mix of people the, the ethnicities, the kids running around and um, just the, the vibe and energy is not, they're not all of the same. I don't like all of the same. Yeah. So there are some neighborhoods I don't like as much. I think it's the more the ones that call everybody fits the same kind of energy. And it's not even an ethnicity thing. Like when I lived in the suburbs, I really didn't like them because it doesn't even you have different ethnicities, but they all feel and, and communicate the same way. Yeah. It's all the yeah. same socioeconomic level. And obviously they're not, but uh, but mostly are. And um, yeah, I don't I don't connect with that. I need that mix. Right. And your favorite park. Uh, these days, my favorite park is probably the um, in Cabbage Town. So you have it's the Riverdale West. So I walk by there every day, but there are so many parks I love in the city. I like uh, uh, Queens Park. It's really nice when I cycle through it. I sit there a lot. Um, even the dog park down on, you know, the, the, the thing with a dog uh, yeah. uh, water uh, fountain. It's yeah, so Wellington cool. Front, I, I, and like near yes. the Flatiron Building. You live yeah. not far from there. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there are many. I just love parks. Uh, which park do you like, by the way, in the city the most, Liza? Well, I don't, I don't, I haven't really focused a lot on parks in my day, um, but there is the one, and I don't, I can't even remember the name, uh, at Harvard and Grace. Oh, yes. Big Tree, maybe? Its maybe it's Big Tree? Um, I don't know. Yeah, and it's just, it, it kind of dips down a bit. So yeah, yeah. that tends to be where, you know, if I'm going to meet a friend or that tends mm -hmm. to be where we go. And I like it because it's, kind of I don't know you feel like you're sort of like cradled almost yeah um and it's got big trees and I just I love I used to live on Grace Street many moons ago and so that neighborhood and that little Italy area which is you know far more diverse now than little Italy but um but it's just it's such a nice neighborhood and yeah. and it's just you know it's got the old mature trees and so they tend to I tend to kind of kind of get pulled towards that yeah. um anyway so i want to i'll add because i almost forgot i can't believe i almost forgot it but kensington market so i was thinking how market, is he not saying kensington? I, how didn't i say that so that's uh 
<laughs> I probably it's Kensington I love so much and but I, I always think I want to live there but I don't want to live there so right. I want it to not change and I want to be at least I don't know 15 minute bike ride from it yeah or less and yeah. which I am and just exactly 15 minutes but the park there is the best it's the kind of grind a little like, dirty and not yeah. and you have all these people doing yoga on the grass and you know when pot was illegal you could like you have all these people selling it on the street and and it was it's still such a cool place so I love going there and getting food and sitting in the park uh, I love the coffee shop there and and uh the big fat burrito and ideal and and uh, oh a bunch of places like it's such a wonderful park to sit and look at people so do you have a favorite restaurant because i would imagine no. that's challenging but give me well, like one of your top 3 i i i, I don't want to do that either uh, i know some guests say that uh, just because there's so many good ones and and like I'll, I'll give you an example so i really love parallel i i, I honestly i'm not tired of it um, but I love House on Parliament. So this mm -hmm. is the, the restaurant bar uh, located on Parliament Street. It's my go-to. I'm there once a week at least when it's open or has a patio. I love sitting and having the chicken sandwich with a batter, uh, ba buttermilk coating and, and, and a good German beer. It's so good. Um, but there's so many. There are so many restaurants in the city that are yeah. just fantastic. And um, yeah, I don't know. Like, okay, I, well, I can't. I can't say. Can't. Can't even. Okay, what about I your favorite coffee say. shop? Because I know you've got favorite coffee shops. So. I do have favorite coffee shops that I'm willing to uh, say. So, um, I love Jet Fuel because, hmm. and and it's also the human element and the vibe element. So it varies. I look at three three things. One's the coffee. Uh, two is the vibe, and three are the people, the like the baristas. So. Yeah, I really like, uh, I love Jet Fuel. I think Sam James does an amazing job. Uh, I think that um, I do Sumac Espresso because they're in my neighborhood and I go there and have great people. Who else? Oh my God. The so Common, many. you like the Common? The Common. You see, I forgot Kensington. The Common is like my synagogue on, I, on I Saturday. I was waiting so. for it. You'll even wait in line. Yes. I, that's <laughs> the only line, yes. So Saturday, I meet my friend there and we now sit on the church uh, stairs across the street. Uh, but when we were allowed to be there inside, you just go and there's these, these wooden tables and there's only one barista and there's always a lineup. And yeah. I think, I don't know how, I, how, how we stand for it, but um, the owner, Anna, or the co-owner, Anna, she's amazing. And she, I don't see her as much there. Just wonderful place to sit and spend an hour Saturday morning and just kind of chill and read a paper and talk to friends and yeah. and and just be. I really love that that vibe. Yeah. Uh, but again, there, yeah, the common. It's probably the top one. Okay. And what's your preferred method of transportation in the city? Uh, ice skating. No, I'm joking. Um, so, <laughs> so I think cycling when weather permits. So right. I don't know, it's four degrees Celsius up and then back down and uh, i'll ride my bike then um i walk a lot i enjoy that okay and i think and sometimes the car of course but yeah I, i'd rather not i think our um our, our listeners are going to get to know the answer to this question but i am going to give you the opportunity to answer it <laughs> so that you actually have time what do you feel is the biggest missed opportunity for the city uh kensington market <laughs> false <laughs> no what uh, I, I honestly uh, if there's one thing i would love uh, that would come out of this is to uh create a, a bridge to the island and preferably two that that is good for pedestrians uh, not for cars uh that the island is such a in my opinion a missed opportunity even though thousands of people go there but the, the, the costs associated with taking that fucking ferry and those taxis and all, and as cute as they are, I can afford them. But a family of five cannot. A family of five, uh, it would be 10 bucks a piece, 50 bucks just to go to a free piece of land that, mm -hmm. that gives you this tremendous feeling. And I think we, we should have a bridge from wherever. It could be from the spit, Leslie Spit. It could be from by the airport there, I don't know. 
and allow that flow of cyclists, of rollerbladers, of walkers to go through and connect. Um, I think only people who'd really want to go will do it. I mean, it's, it will be a schlep to go over it. It's not that close. No, uh, and you'll always have the people that will just take the ferry and keep it exactly, simple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'll still have go that. The families and yes. Yeah. Um, but I don't want it to be the only means of transportation. And I don't know if you know that, but um, I'd say, wow, was it 100 years ago that actually the island wasn't an island? It was a peninsula. And it was connected mm. to the, the land um, by the eastern side. And some storm kind of took that away. Right. And I guess maybe the water levels increased a little, but it wasn't always an island. And um, I would, I would love, I think it's just, a, it's like our central park and it should be, it should be treated that way. It should be tra- treated as a, it's a, a park for everyone. And a, pre- yeah. a park for everyone doesn't mean you have to pay 50 bucks for your family to go and go there and come back. Right. Okay. And what do you think is one of the bureaucratic nightmares for the city? I, Just yeah, it's, one. no, there, there's so many. And I think just city hall needs to, it's, it's city hall needs to remember that it's there for the people and the people that may make the city move forward are the entrepreneurs. And I, I understand the importance of city hall to create sure. rules and regulations. So people don't run amok and do whatever they want. And it's not the wild west here. However, I would like us to have more of a European feel to our streets where mm-hmm. people eat and drink more on the streets, where um, restaurants can have more patios. This cafe TO thing is great. But this season, again, they're giving a lot of restaurants that I know uh, um, a lot of issues in opening their, their uh, patios. And it just is beyond my understanding. Um, yeah. You know, let's, let's allow people to go on the street. Let's you know, charge whatever you need for that usage, but not, don't make it prohibitive. Right. And let's bring people out. We have the summer is so short and let's just be outside and enjoy each other. It's, it's just so much more fun to go down the street and you see all these people sitting and enjoying themselves. Uh, yeah. I would love that to do. So I, I would love the city to just be more flexible and, and um, do, do just, eva- just look, look seriously at, at the process and not be so bureaucratic. So, yeah. Right. Evolve, evolve with, with what people want, because really the, the people can govern themselves. We don't yeah, need it's to like, be- it's like the drinking in parks. Give me yeah. a break. Like yeah. if somebody is acting up and is being doing illegal things while they're intoxicated, well, the police can come and take care of them. Yes. Um, yes. If they're sitting with their boyfriend, girlfriend, family, whatever, having a couple beers and just laughing and talking, yeah. you know, it's none of the, the police's business to come and, and police people sitting mm-hmm. down in parks and having a good time. It, it, it isn't. Yeah. So I, I would just like the, the city hall to remember that it's there for us and not the other way around. Yeah, the, absolutely. The city hall and bureaucrats are here for the people they work for us. Well, the entire and, government, and, the entire yeah, government yeah. should have that mindset that they work for yeah, the yeah. people. And Definitely. when they legalized marijuana, there mm-hmm. was such a kerfuffle. They thought everyone was going to be high in the streets, unable to go to work. You can't drive. It's crazy. And no, Lisa, you people, came to work every day when every you were high. Every single day you. on time. <laughs> but it didn't actually it didn't, our, our level of work uh, increased. It got it got more creative, didn't it? Okay, we'll move along. Um, which charity is close to your heart? Uh, so yes, youth employment services. I've been had a relationship with them for the longest time. And uh, I gave a lot of my time to them, and I really believe in them, and I really believe in helping young, young entrepreneurs, yeah. uh, give them the, the, the support they need because just it's so awesome. Uh, yeah. I love uh, sick kids. So I, I, I just really, uh, sick kids is close to my heart. We unfortunately have some experience with sick kids. Um, so I, I support them. And I want to also Regent Park. Uh, I, I support, uh, I'm beginning to, when I'm here to, to find out about a few organizations here and uh, I, I'd like to get involved with someone here. Okay. All right. So we'll move to the quick fire. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to ask you, you the question, even though I know the answers. You can answer most of these questions. I can. Fine. But for I, our I'm listeners, sure, you know that what what is it? Bath or shower for me? 
For you, I would say shower. Mm, okay. Okay. See, now I have to ask the questions. Coffee or tea? Oh, well, coffee, hands down. Even with your British background? Yes, coffee. yes, I okay. don't do tea, so no. Okay. Uh, dark or milk chocolate? Yeah, dark. Beer, wine, or whiskey? Uh, definitely beer, but whiskey is not far behind. Okay. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? I would say either lunch or dinner. Okay. Home cooked meal decided. or takeout? Uh, 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 I don't know. Both. <laughs> If someone else is cooking, both. is it home cooked meal or takeout? I out? love both. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I, I can't answer that. City or countryside? Who made questions up. Um, city. Favorite season. I, I like every season. I really enjoy every season. That's the beauty love of this the... country. And I, I yeah, yeah. lived in, got... in I've lived in places that don't have seasons. And that was the one thing I missed the most. No, was you know, season. people who love the sun, they, they wish it was summer all the time. I would kill myself if it was summer all the yes. time. I don't like that. Right. But that, that kind of the transition uh, between one and another and, uh, is just great. Yeah, yeah. And you get to enjoy every one of them. Like now we're in spring and you're looking at the budding flowers and yeah. the leaves coming out and all that. Okay. So, um, all right. It's yeah. quick fire. So I'm going to keep going. Oh, sorry. Yes. yes. <laughs> Night I'm out or fire. stay at home? Night out. Morning person or night owl? Um, again, both. Okay, bath or shower? Uh, bath, actually. I really uh, enjoy a good bath. Okay. When you enter the swimming pool, do you jump in or do you tiptoe slowly? I used to tiptoe slowly. Now I jump in. Cat or dog person? Dog. Books or Netflix or TV? I would like to say books, but it is Netflix. Okay. Phone calls the or attention texts? Attention span. <laughs> um, texts. Texts. And music or podcasts? Oddly, music. Hmm. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for allowing us to, getting to, to get to know you a little more. And I'd say, is there anything else you want to say to people? But <laughs> you're going to get no, a chance I, to say I, yeah, it with like, every interview. Yeah, and I think that uh, Liza, I'm really happy we're doing this together and uh, I'm yeah. excited about this whole series. I have uh, committed, I think we have committed to yeah. 20 episodes, so, mm -hmm. and then we'll reevaluate. But so far, just um, talking to these six individuals was charges you with energy and, and yeah. uh, uh, just beautiful people that, that are doing stuff in the city and, and really know the city and are the city. And and their followers are the city. So I, it's, it's, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. And it's nice, particularly at a time where connection and belonging is feeling a bit lost. Um, mm -hmm. It's just an extra way. Yes, it's online um, or virtual or however we want to say it. Uh, but it is an insight into a lot of these people's stories and what they're going through right now and what they've gone through in their life. And it's just it pays homage to how interesting every individual is and how the, their stories make up who they are. And they're, I, I mean, I, I don't think I would ever meet a non-interesting person if I were to ask them these questions. It just brings out uh, the human side and the interesting side yeah. and, and just, you know, just, just allows us to lean in a bit and- yes and get to know people and the beauty of being able to share that with other people is extra special. So I, I say that if you know their business and you're curious about their business, listen to the podcast. Cause you'll see, you'll get yeah. to know the person behind it. Yeah. And it would be so much, so much better of a business. Cause you know, who, who's the person behind it. Yeah, there is, there's more, it becomes, it's just special. It's special. So we hope you all enjoyed as much as we're enjoying doing it. I hope you all enjoyed listening to me talking about me as much as I <laughs> love talking about myself. It felt like <laughs> the that first time horrible? along. Did, was that? <laughs> God, he's such an asshole. I can't <laughs> listen to him anymore. Uh, Very thank good. You. Thank, thank you. you thank you, uh, Liza. Thank and you, thank everyone. you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for questioning. Okay. okay Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.